Somewhere in the riot of playing the Festival of Colors, tradition gets tinted by the present. Holy marks the triumph of good over evil, rooted in ritual, like India itself. But as a celebration of spring, it's also an embrace of change. Two days later, a different kind of gathering, though this too is about tradition and change. About a segment of society that usually has no claim to the streets here. Protests are a stark but temporary exception. And lately, they seem to achieve little. Jagjit Kaur is a rare one-woman protest. She says she was raped by a police official. Over three years, she once tried going on hunger strike, had people dismiss her as a fake, but she's never managed to get police to register her case as required by law. She is blunt on the downsides of speaking up. The message is this, she says, that if a woman comes out and fights for herself, she will not get justice in India. I don't think any girl should come out and fight like this, she says. Instead, she will have to pick up a gun to get revenge. New Delhi, hardly representative of all India. But it does exhibit many of its problems. On its streets, where men always dominate, women can look like uncomfortable visitors. Not Shanti. As a resident, she long ago memorized a map of Delhi's danger zones. As a taxi driver, she spirits other women through them. Oh, this road is, uh, I think, jungle road, jungle area. They're not safe for women. They never come alone? Never come alone, yeah. Would you walk down this road? No. Yeah. No. Hi, Shanti. Nice to meet you. How are you? Hi, thank you. The company is both charity and employer. Over several months, the trainees learn about women's rights, self-defense, as well as driving and changing attire. Shanti left an abusive husband and as a single mom makes three times what she made before. And that car means no more bus commutes. And if you're a woman who takes the bus in Delhi, you know how precious that is. But I feel proud. When, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't bother her that people stare. And she's never felt safer. Challenges, women are challenging men at several skills, she says. But they're not yet equal. The demand is so high, the fleet of just 18 cars just can't keep up. Because New Delhi lately has been a shocking showcase for India's epidemic of rape and harassment. 300 reported rapes so far this year, 500 molestations, and who knows how many unreported, but the national rape average is about three every hour. Three high-profile cases have hogged the headlines. There's the Uber taxi driver accused of raping a passenger the renowned environmentalist accused of sexually harassing a younger colleague, and still, the 2012 Delhi gang rape back in the headlines after one of the rapists blamed the victim in an interview. As you can see, it's guarded by men. Most of these places are guarded by men. According to safety audits, Delhi is also a city with a light problem and in parts, a toilet problem. Both shortages directly affect women's safety, and both are widespread across India. Here's another one of these bathrooms on a main artery. And here, there's a gent, but nothing for women at all. One of the worst places for harassment are bus stops and buses. It was on a bus that the Delhi gang rape took place. 
She fought her attackers, but they injured her so grievously, she later died. Now a battle is being waged against the fear and against would-be attackers. So I push you here, here, and then back, and then disconnect. Demand for self-defense training has surged among women who can afford it, or those who work for companies that pay for it. Dipti Shankar liked it so much, she gave up a career in fashion design and is now a trainer herself. As I grew up as a girl, you know, there were various things that I faced and I felt like so many times, why wasn't I a boy? And why, why, why did I grow up in a place like India, where in every single day we have experiences, somebody looks at you, somebody passes a lewd remark. It's what brought most of them here. Yet there is a sense there's more to this woman's battle than a well-executed kick. I think they are speaking up more because and the revolution, it takes time, as you said. It is building up and it will reach that eventually, I think. Until then, their instructor, a former army captain with his own 18-year-old daughter to worry about, has ample advice. They should look confident. They should not venture out alone and they should stay prepared. It's more important to also educate uh, men that if I'm wearing a short dress, my dear friend, it's not for you, it's for me. So if, if they get, get that sort of uh, understanding, I think things are going to change. To be very honest, the men in India still remain the same. There's not much change in the way they look at women and probably the way women are getting empowered and the way we are growing up, they're feeling more threatened and they don't like it. But she says the dangers also lurk at home from abusive husbands like her ex to close relatives like those of some of the hundreds of girls she trains. And that's the bitter truth of India, you know? These days, the government is touting self-defense as the answer. On International Women's Day, Delhi police put on display its training program for schoolgirls. At the women's protest, fighting back is a theme, but against a more fundamental problem, men's attitudes. Here, many accuse the government of shutting down that debate at every turn including by banning a BBC documentary on the subject. Activists say it is a persistent problem. Every time we try to talk about it in terms of women's freedoms rather than women's safety, when we try to bring the discussion to talking about you know, equality for all women, there is an attempt to take the conversation back to the old discussion. So how do you measure progress in an uneven battle with uneven gains? For one mother, it's partly how long she must wait before her daughter's rapists are hanged. I would like to thank you all for coming today. Her daughter is known as Nirbaya, the 2012 Delhi gang rape victim. Her real name is hidden to comply with Indian law to shield her identity. <laughs> Once a shy stay-at-home mom who grieved anonymously, Asha has now started a trust for victims and speaks publicly. <laughs> She's chosen to fight. We've been fighting our battle for the last two and a half years, but there has been no result. There are cases every day, which is why we organize this meeting so that we can get together and do something about it. Uh, public prosecutors and doctors have forensic hair. Invited are judges, doctors and activists to discuss loopholes that allow rapists to walk free despite the tougher, new anti-rape laws. Yogita Chakraborty is an activist who works with Asha, who's just watched two cases fall apart for lack of evidence. Definitely I feel sad and I really feel furious because when Nirbhaya case happened, we, we all protested outside Jantar Mantar and we, we really were into it and we thought things will change because everybody was on the street. So we really thought things will change, but nothing has changed after that. The meeting starts with testimony from a lineup of the aggrieved, still waiting for justice. Father of a five-year-old rape victim, a mother of two abused kids, and a roomful of rage. Forget about legal system. This is a country which murders girl child in the mother's womb. 
This is a country where we still haven't given women the respect we deserve. And this is the challenge that we are facing. At home, Asha tells us she feels lonely without her daughter. The death sentences handed to her killers are on appeal at the Supreme Court. It could be months or more. We have lost a young daughter. It is very difficult, but if we sit back quietly, we will not get justice. We will not get her back, but we don't want any other girl to suffer like ours. There are words of wisdom on every corner in Delhi. Every alley, every neighborhood slum. Here, you learn that words are almost the only recourse for poor women. No one is safe here. I have been to the police so many times, but there is no hearing. They listen to the rich, but not the poor. Men come harass our women, but there are no means to stop it. The means are only available for the rich. But even here, when the blame game is played, the women push back. This man says girls and women should dress properly, walk properly, talk properly. Shakila challenges him. She says many people let their boys get away with harassment, that they protect them even when they are at fault. It's why Sunita Rani won't go out with her girls after dark. In a country where nearly half the brides are under 18, she dreams of getting them educated. Times are better than they used to be, she says. In the past, men used to beat up their wives, she says. They wouldn't let their wives step out of the house. These days, they at least listen to their wives a little bit. On Jantar Mantar, little has changed for Kaur. She tries her hand at public speaking. The man who has raped me is an influential man. That is why the government is not taking action, she says. Why should they not listen to me? Do you think it is easy to live on the streets and protest? How else can a woman raise her voice? Turns out, in a lot of ways, unimaginable a handful of years ago. Across India, hundreds of thousands have watched that banned documentary. And more rapes, wrapped in shame before, are being reported than ever. transition in which men must also take part, says Badri, Nirvaya's father. No father wants something untowards happening to their daughters. But we don't want any father to stop his daughter from going out. They should give her the best of education and help her achieve whatever she wants to achieve in life. But do they really believe it's a winnable fight? Of course it will happen. If there's night, there's also morning. We'll fight until we see some light. It is a subtle but rising revolt. And it is often in just such transitions that the fight becomes fierce. Nala Ayad, CBC News, New Delhi.